Okay, thanks, Michael. It's my pleasure to be here, and good evening to your listeners. This evening we're going to be discussing Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, that chapter in the book of Romans written by Paul, which we are taught leads us to believe that we are to be subject to the civil law of the land, right or wrong. And uh, I think we need to talk about this in context of the rest of the Bible and the rest of history. And so before I begin my discussion, I want to first read uh, Romans chapter 13 in its entirety without comment. And then we'll retreat to to verse 1 and go through this chapter verse by verse and cut it up and glean as much wisdom as we possibly can and see if we do not come to a different conclusion than the one that has been handed to us by the churches. Beginning in Romans chapter 13 and verse 1, and I'll read to the end and then we'll return to the beginning. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God unto thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but for also for conscience' sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Now, I'm sure everyone heard that that, and heard it well within the context of what the churches teach, that we are to be subject to the higher powers, that is, the civil governments of whatever level, local, county, state, and federal. And we are to unquestioningly and complicitly obey their laws and commands. 
Now remember, these admonitions were given by the Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles. The Gospel had been given to the Gentiles because Israel had rejected Christ and rejected the truth, and God had sent them into dispersion throughout the world. He had dis- had the, dis- the temple destroyed in 70 A.D., and the Israelites were scattered among the nations. So this letter is to the Gentiles, and he tells us, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. Now, every soul includes believers and unbelievers alike. He says, but there is no, there, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So we know that the civil power is ordained by God. There needs to be a law on the earth, a governor to reward good and to punish evil. In other words, to prevent chaos and for societies to work in support and that the the society does not uh, deteriorate into chaos. Remember, all have sinned and and, and, uh, fallen short of the glory of God. And if unbelievers are left to themselves without a governing authority, then one can only imagine how depraved the society would become over a short period of time. If every man became his own judge and did what was right in his own eyes, Believers and unbelievers alike would soon deteriorate from what God had intended for man on this earth. Now, in verse 2 he said, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So the powers that be on the earth, all forms of civil government, are ordained of God. They are the ordinance of God, and those who resist that power resist God. And to resist God is to condemn oneself. So we have clearly an establishment of an earthly power comprised of men, not God, but they are to be servants of God, and we are to obey them. And he says in verse 3, for rulers, here again he's using a different term to describe what he's already set forward, the civil powers, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. In other words, the civil powers are to reward good and punish evil. That's their purpose. That's their divine purpose. And he says, wilt thou not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. So if we do what is good, then we can expect at least not to suffer the terror that can be imposed upon us by that civil power, but if, it's, if the civil power is functioning properly, we would receive praise for doing good. In verse 4, he says, for he, that is, the civil powers, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. In other words, he's to reward good and punish evil. That is good, correct? But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon them that doeth evil. So the civil power is well within its God-given right and prerogative to punish evil. So therefore, we should do what is good. And if we do evil, then we can expect to be treated likewise by this power and the and the, and the civil powers are well within their jurisdiction to punish evil. Now, if we resist the, the, the government's lawful and divine prerogative to reward good and to punish evil, then we become 
subject to the higher power, the civil power, and we can expect to be treated likewise. And God literally takes his hand of protection away from us once we transgress the authorized power of the civil government to reward good and to punish evil. Now, I want to stop and ask you all a question. What is good and what is evil? Who determines what is good and what is evil? Who is the highest power? Is it the civil government? Is it the federal government? The state government? The county government? Or the local municipal government? Or is it God himself? Remember, it was God who gave jurisdiction to the civil power. The civil power is a servant to God to reward good and to punish evil. Is that civil power to depart from God's authority then once established and establish for itself what is good and what is evil? What if the civil power departs from God's authority and begins to act in its own interests and and against or contrary to the law of God? begins to operate outside the the natural divine limits and bounds that God set for the civil power to reward good and to punish evil. What if the civil power, whether it be federal, state, county, or local municipal governments, what if they become a government of and by themselves? independent of any authority from God, and begins to operate like a God itself, and begins to pass law and enforce laws that are not good, but that cause men, force men, to do that which God says is evil. I want to take you back in the book of Daniel to a story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were commanded to bow down to a a golden image. Now, God in his divine law says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Thou shalt not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. In other words, those who bow down to images and idols and showing mercy unto the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. But King Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't have it. He wanted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to bow down to that golden image, and they refused. So the civil power, the federal government of Babylon at the time, King Nebuchadnezzar ordered them executed by fire in a furnace. And it wasn't good enough to just burn them alive in a furnace. No, he wanted the furnace heated seven times what it was normally heated to. In other words, it was a raging inferno in there, so hot that it even threatened the existence of the furnace itself. And yet, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we will not bow down to your image. We will not bow down to your image. And even if you cast us into the fire, we will not bow down to your image. And even God can save us. And being thoroughly angered, as you might imagine, Nebuchadnezzar ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego cast into the fiery furnace, heated seven times hotter than it was normally heated. And it was to, to Nebuchadnezzar's amazement that after Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been cast into the fiery furnace, he peered inside and saw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walking around. And yet there was another, a fourth figure in that blazing furnace, one likened unto the Son of God. And Nebuchadnezzar called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego forth. And they came out of the furnace without even the smell of smoke on their clothes. 
there is a time when we should not obey the civil powers, the powers that be, that power that is ordained of God, when he commands us to do that which God forbids. In verse 13, in chapter 13, verse 5, it says, Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. In other words, we need to be subject to the civil powers. All of those civil powers that are placed in authority over us, because they are a servant of God to reward good and to punish evil. And we should not obey the civil power just for fear of the civil power's wrath, but also for conscience' sake, because God has ordained that power. And so long as the power remains within its divine limitations, we are to obey it for conscience' sake. Now remember early in the Christian era, The Christians, it is said in the scriptures, rather, the gospel had turned the world upside down. It had overthrown the the order of things in the world. And what was that overturning? It was the recognition that Jesus was God on earth, and he had a law, and he had a people. He was a king, a king of kings and lord of lords. And he had a people that obeyed him and trusted him and submitted them not necessarily to the civil power, but governed themselves within the law of God. And they were to consult one another and therefore never anger the civil power. They were to be a light unto the nations. They were to be an example to be followed, just like Israel was intended by God to be a, a, a shining city on a hill, to make every pagan Gentile nation jealous of the Israelite God. And had they remained faithful and obedient to the, to the God of heaven, the God of creation, all the world would have envied and coveted the system that God had set up for Israel. But Israel, as we know, constantly wanted to compete or to be like, in many respects, like the heathen nations around them. And they began to worship images and idols and other gods, even erecting uh, trees or, or upright pillars, phallic symbols and the like, called the groves in the Bible. And this angered God, and he overthrew them, and eventually punished them, and made them no longer a nation after they rejected Jesus, the truth. So we can see that the civil power ordained of God, to which we are to be subject, cannot, with God's blessing, continue outside of that authority and become a God and a law unto itself and to begin to serve itself instead of serving God. Remember the scripture says the civil power is the minister of God. When the civil power no longer is the minister of God, it is no power. It says let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Remember the portion of Scripture that says man ought to obey God rather than men? What is the civil power but a government of men? And as long as they stay within the bounds and operate according to the function that God set for them to reward good and to punish evil, then we are to be subject to them. But once they become a god unto themselves, like Nebuchadnezzar, and force us to do things that we know in our conscience are contrary to the law of God, then we should not fear that government's wrath, but we should obey God 
for conscience sake. Now, Revelation, or rather Romans chapter 13, speaks of a government ordained of God operating within the limits and with the duties ordained of God. And it says in verse 6, for 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 this cause pay ye tribute also. In other words, taxes. For they are God's ministers. They are God's ministers. Not God's unto themselves. They are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. In other words, their job is to be a full-time minister of God, and we are to pay tribute, taxes, to support that work. We are not to be without a law, a civil law in this land and anywhere God's people exist. The civil power has its purpose and plan in God's eyes. Now, he says in verse 7, render therefore all their dues and everything that is due them, render it to them tribute, to whom tribute is due, custom, to whom custom, fear, to whom fear, and honor, to whom honor. So we are to pay taxes and to revere the civil power and pay it its due. Tribute, custom, fear, and honor. But what if the government becomes a law unto itself, a God to the people, and begins to rule and reign contrary to the limits that God set for it. In other words, it becomes an ungodly government. Do we then pay tribute, custom, fear, and honor? Or do we do what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did? That's the decision every one of us has to make. But I remind you once again, the scripture says clearly, man ought to obey God rather than men. And since our governments are made of fallible men, prone to sin, prone to make slaves of us so that they may use us and so that they may profit from us, and then to do their own bidding on the earth and to reward evil and to punish good, are we still bound by the commands, the legitimate commands of Romans chapter 13? Now verse 8 says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. In other words, don't hold your fellow brother in debt. Give as God inclines and expect nothing in return. Freely you have been given, freely give. We are to love one another. If our brother has need and we have excess and we can give to our brother with no strings attached, no debt to pay, no interest to pay, and we're simply giving out of the goodness of our heart, then when we give, we bless our neighbor and we put no debt upon his head. Out of the goodness of our heart, freely we have received of God, freely we give. No strings attached. That's the law of liberty. You see, if no one holds another in debt, then there's no cause for controversy. If you do a good deed for your neighbor, don't expect anything in return because if something happens and your neighbor can't pay you back for something that you freely gave or should have freely given, then you place a debt upon his head. You make a slave of him. And then you become angered if your neighbor can't come and, re- and, and repay you in like manner as you've given to him. 
and then there's controversy. And if there's controversy and it leads to violence, then the civil power is within its jurisdiction, its lawful divine jurisdiction, to punish evil. And whoever, whatever man raises his hand against another to collect a debt that he should not owe, or that he should not receive, had he given freely, if he raises his hand to collect his debt, and he offends his brother, and his old brother, and his brother complains to the civil power, then the civil power can come and do as it pleases to punish evil. How many times have brother Christians fallen into controversy over helping one another and giving gifts to one another, gifts that weren't gifts at all, but that carried a debt with them, which eventually led to controversy, which eventually led to the civil power, the law of men, to take over and to punish the evil. We to remain as much as possible totally unsuspected by this civil power. We are to operate under the law of liberty and under the law of love for one another. And what authority or what terror can the civil power have over such a system? You see, we still have a king, and we still have a kingdom, and we still have a law, and we're still to be the shining city upon the hill. We're supposed to be in the world, but not part of it. We are not to conform to this world. We are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And we renew our minds by reading the gospel, all of it, from cover to cover, and obeying the laws that God gave us, the laws of conscience, the laws that will keep us out of controversy with the, with the divinely authorized civil power. We should not fear its terror. We should only re- expect its reward. And any time in the endeavors of life we find ourselves in controversy that might raise up the attention of the civil power, we must make amends quickly with our neighbor to avoid that confrontation. We're to remain separate, holy, and sanctified unto God. Separate in the world, but not of it. Not, we, we should be totally subject to the civil power, but not fearing its terror, not fearing its rod. Model citizens, beyond reproach, and nothing but a blessing to the civil power. No, owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. What law is that? Is that God's law or man's law? It's God's law. But you you say, Tom, we're not under the law anymore. Yeah, they teach you that in the churches too. But I ask you the question again. If the civil power is to be the rewarder of good and the punisher of evil, what is good and what is evil? Is it what man decides or what God decides? The Bible condemns those who call evil good and good evil. And even a haphazard observation of the civil government of the United States at all levels punishes good and rewards evil. In our nation, those who preach and teach the Word of God, the King James Bible, uh, the King James Bible, are regarded as haters, and they are persecuted by the civil power, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
we've got a choice to make, and we're not being informed of the crisis that is upon us by the churches in our country. Someone has corrupted our churches. Now, interestingly, in verse 9, Paul quotes the law of God, the commandments, that which the churches say we are no longer under. Correct? Don't they say that? Mine did. We're not under the law, they said. We're under grace. But Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, says, For this thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This is God's law. This is the second table of God's law. Remember, there were two tables of the law. The one table had to do, if you'll read it in Exodus chapter 20, Read the law for yourself. The first tab- tablet of the law had to do with man's relationship to God. Four commandments. I am the Lord thy God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the second one was just like it. Thou shalt not make any graven images to bow down to it and worship it and serve it. For I'm a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, showing mercy to the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou work and do all thy labor, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, neither thou or thy mad servant, nor your maid servant, nor the, or ox, or any anybody within thy gates. For in six days the Lord created the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. And on the seventh day he rested. The seventh day he hallowed, he made it holy. Once God declares something holy, can man change it? Can man make it unholy? Can man change the day to observe the Sabbath? And the fourth commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. In other words, you can't call yourself a Christian when you're not one. There were those, you know, who called themselves Jews and who were not Jews. And today there are multitudes, multitudes who call themselves Christians and are nothing of the sort. In vain they use God's name and claim it for themselves when they are his avowed enemies. But the second tablet of the law, which is written right here for us to read for ourselves in brief, is the second table of the law. We've dealt with the first table of the law that represents man's duty to God. The second table of the law had to do with man's relationship to man. We should not sin against God by violating his law. We should not serve any other gods. We shall not make any images. We shall not take his name in vain, and we shall not change or abuse or put the sole of our foot upon his Sabbath. If he is our God, then we ought to obey his laws. And we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. 
the second table of the law, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, considering your neighbor better than yourself. When we do that, when we refuse to commit adultery, we refuse, no matter how much Satan tempts us to kill, if we refuse, no matter how often and how strongly Satan tempts us, we do not steal, and if we do not bear false witness, and if we do not covet anything that is our neighbor's, then we truly do love our neighbor as ourselves. And we are not under condemnation from this civil power, nor are we in con- under condemnation from God in heaven. We have fulfilled the law. That's what we are supposed to do. Now, what of those among us and from the pulpits who say we're not under the law, we're under grace? Do you realize that if you violate God's law and don't confess it and continue in that claiming that you're under grace, you make God the minister of unrighteousness? And if you make God the minister of unrighteousness, then all Christians become subject to the terror of the civil power. And that's not what God wants for his people. We want to be beyond reproach. We want to be a good name for Christ. Bring honor and glory to Christ's name so that all would be jealous of our God and come to him. But if we become above the law and claim grace and sin to our heart's content, just plead the blood, like they tell you, then what are we to our neighbor? Both believer and unbeliever alike. Nothing but a nuisance. And then we become under the subject subjection to the civil power. And if that power has become a law unto itself, even more terror. If the civil power begins to call evil good and good evil, then there's nothing but chaos in relationship to God's holy and eternal and immutable law. I ask the question again. Are we to obey unquestioningly the civil power? If it be a godly government, if it stays within the bounds and limits set for it by God himself in this book to reward good and to punish evil, good that is determined by God and his law, and evil as determined by God and his law, then he is a servant of God, and we do well to fear the sword of the civil power. But when that government shakes loose the cords that has bound it from heaven and becomes a terror unto itself, then we must do what God says and reject what man says. And if the government of man begins to reward evil and punish good, calling good evil and evil good, and ruling outside the jurisdiction that God has placed, has abandoned God's law and has become a law and a God unto itself, shall we serve it? I ask the question, Was Germany right to serve Hitler, or were they wrong? It's a question we all must ask.
It says, love worketh no evil, no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. The law of love and the law of liberty makes us free from the terror of the civil power. And that knowing the time, that now is, it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the, dark, the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. What is light? I am the way, the truth, and the light. No man comes to the Father but my me. Right? So let not the civil power call the light darkness and the darkness light. Let not the civil power call evil good and good evil, because then he becomes subject to the authority that reigneth from heaven forever and forever. That power that ordained the civil power to begin with can take that power away and can punish that evil ruler. And that's just what's going to happen. I tell you, my listeners, for, again, the new world order is simply the old world order restored. In the old world order, the papacy declared itself, outside of God's jurisdiction, declared itself the king of kings and the lord of lords. And the papacy, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist, made his threats good by crowning the kings of Europe and uncrowning them at his pleasure. And they did not serve God, they served the Pope, who called good evil and evil good. And they went about the civil powers under his control, under the papacy's control, went about killing God's people to the tune of hundreds of millions of people by the most heinous treatments one can imagine. And if the new world order is the same as the old world order, only restored, then we can expect the same thing from the civil power, that it will depart from its lawful divine jurisdiction and serve another God, one that calls himself God on earth, the papacy. And again, that unlawful usurper of God's rightful throne will cause the kings of the earth to reward evil and to punish good, to call light darkness and darkness light, and will begin once again to kill God's obedient people, simply because they are obedient to a higher power. The highest power. He says in verse 13, Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness. Because if we riot and drunk and be are drunken, then we come under the jurisdiction of the civil power. (laughs) Excuse me. Not in chambering and wantonness. What is this talking about? Listen, we're supposed to be contributing members of society, working, studious, taxpayers, giving honor where honor is due, tribute where tribute is due. We are to be beyond reproach. We are to be industrious, not slothful, not lazy, not unemployed. And what is chambering in reference to? This has to do with the bedchamber. Closing oneself in a room. We're not to be hermits. We're not to be monks. We're not to be cloistered. This is a direct assault. This use of the word chambering is a direct assault against the Roman Catholic Church and what it calls the cloisters, the nunneries, the, the, the monasteries, where the men in the monasteries are kept out of society, not contributing to society, but becoming a burden upon society, not 
engaging their members in, in, in creative work, but to be slothful as a matter of career, and then to meddle, to get into the affairs of nations. Do you realize that the governments and the laws that are imposed upon the people through the civil powers are those that have been thought up in the chambers of the monks and the nuns? That's right. They work for the papacy. They are idle. They they disobey God's law. They obey the Pope's law, and they're nothing but think tanks on how the papacy may enslave us. Did you know that our entire accounting system, the, the accounting system that we use today, was created by a Roman Catholic monk? Our entire financial system, which is diametrically opposed to the, the economic system given to us by God or given to Israel by God, it's completely contrary. Where did it come from? From the monasteries, the monks. Now you know what they do in the monasteries. Besides, debauch one another as sodomites and debauch the nunneries and cause their illegitimate children, which everybody knows that knows anything about the Roman Catholic Church, they took those illegitimate babies and smothered them and buried them in the basement of the nunneries. They were found out after the nunneries were liberated and destroyed and examined. Nothing but good, nothing but evil can come from chambering, locking oneself in a cloister instead of becoming a beneficial participant in the nation a contributor to the nation, a working contributor to the nation. Nothing but trouble resides in the cloisters. It says, not in chambering and wantonness. Wantonness, a preoccupation with sexual gratification. You're not to lock yourself up in the chamber with your wife or anyone else and waste the days away not contributing to the benefit of society, but engaging in sexual gratification. There's more to life than sex. It's a gift from God to be enjoyed by married couples, but within limits, normal, natural limits. Look, if you're spending all of your time gratifying your sexual desires, you're not a contributor to society. You're not a contributor to the to the the shining city on a hill. You're not a blessing to your neighbors. You're not putting a good name on Jesus Christ. Okay? Not in chambering and wantonness. Not in strife and envying. You realize we're just to love one another as ourselves and to be contributors to society beyond reproach, that's our rightful role as God's people living in the world to be a good example. And he closes with verse 14. He says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Again, we're warned, as Paul even said, about his own body, he called it vile and filthy. The natural proclivity of a man without the internal regulation of the law of God is nothing but depravity. We're not to fulfill the laws or or the lusts of the flesh. We are to resist the flesh and seek to be like Christ. We are to obey the civil power but we are to, above all, obey God rather than men. Again, I say the papacy has risen once again to its lofty status, its false status, a status of which God did not give it, 
the papacy has elevated itself once again with the help of the nations to king of kings and lord of lords. And the governments do not any longer rule under God's oversight, but under the papacy's oversight. And you see evil being rewarded and good being condemned. You see homosexuals, rather sodomites, heralded in the streets, becoming mainstream and equal rights with God-fearing people. You see a system which taxes the righteous and gives that to the to the wicked strengthening the wicked making no distinction between that which is holy and that which is profane treating every man alike heathen and righteous that's not the shining city on the hill that God intended his kingdom his people to be and yet we are told by our pastors in our once protestant churches that the pope is just well he's a christian like you and me and that the government of the united states at all levels federal state county and local municipal is uh to be obeyed unquestioningly right or wrong Forget Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were fools. We are to do whatever the civil power says. And even if the Pope, a Christian, they claim, is the king of kings, the king of our king, and the lord of our lords, then we're to obey him, even if he contradicts Scripture, even if he contradicts God's law. Even if he calls evil good and good evil, we are to obey him. I don't believe that's what Romans chapter 13 is teaching us. I don't believe that's what Daniel taught us. I don't believe that's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego taught us. And don't you remember? Jesus' biggest problem was the government of Israel. That's all I have tonight. Thanks for listening. My name is Tom Frest, host of Inquisition Update, heard Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. Central Time on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Stop in and say hi, and I'll turn it back over to the host. Well, that's the question I posed the other night in a private discussion with you and Walt. What happens when we discover that our taxes go to pay for our military to go on crusade to conquer other lands for the Pope, the Antichrist of the Bible. We uh, find ourselves in a tremendous controversy with God, I believe, in paying taxes that we know are going to go to our federal government that are going to finance wars not to protect the sovereignty of this nation or the rights of its people, or to promote the gospel, but to militarily overthrow regimes that will not obey the Pope, the Antichrist. Now, it doesn't matter if you think the Muslims against whom we are at war now are not Christians, they're heretics and heathens, It matters not that you believe our tax money goes for a righteous thing when you find out, really, that the papacy is using the United States, its economic and military power, its power to tax from the people, to finance wars, to conquer the Muslim nations, to bring them into subjection, to the global government of the papacy that is building itself back up to the glory that it had in the first millennium 
when the papacy was all powerful in Europe. What do we do when we begin to realize that our tax money goes to help the papacy establish this new world order that, is no, that has no other purpose but to destroy the sovereignty of nations, nations which God created at the Tower of Babel when he confounded the languages and the people segregated amongst themselves according to their languages and migrated to their own countries. God separated the people so that they could never be united again in unity against God, all together against God, and to worship and obey a man by the name of Nimrod. What if we find out that our tax money is being collected by the United States government at the behest of the papacy to help bring all nations back under the headship and government of one man? The the counterfeit Christ on earth, the papacy. I... uh, I don't feel I should have an obligation to pay taxes to help persecute God's people because that's what Rome has always done. Rome will persecute God's people or it will cease to be Rome. The Antichrist will continue to persecute God's people, call evil good and good evil, or it will cease to be the Antichrist. That's what the papacy is. And that same dollar that goes to conquer, remember Constantine and his vision, by this sign conquer, that's still the motto of the papacy. By this sign, the sign of the cross, conquer. Somebody show me anywhere in the scripture where God told us to conquer anything. (laughs) Nowhere. But that's what we do in the sign of the cross as a Christian nation under the authority of the papacy, we march off to foreign wars all over this land, become the global police force, overthrowing regimes that simply will never bend the knee to the Pope, will never accept a global government, that want to maintain their separate, independent, and sovereign nations as set forth by God at the Tower of Babel. But Rome says, no, I am the vicar, the replacement of God on earth. And the governments of the world must obey me or be overthrown or be conquered because I have the power just by the word of my mouth to conjure up all the armies of the world to go against that nation that dares to rebel against me and not obey my command just like he did in the old world order. I'm not dreaming this up. I've studied the old world order. That's what Protestants don't do anymore. They don't read the history of the papacy during the first half of the Christian era. That's why they're clueless that the papacy is doing the same thing in the second half of the Christian era. That old world order, having once been nearly destroyed, by the Protestant Reformation has now conquered the Protestant Reformation and is now regaining its strength and returning to its diabolical ways. And no one needs to be confused or confounded or, or, or questioning anymore who's in control of our government. Why our government doesn't tend to, to support the, 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 uh, the liberties of the people and has made slaves out of the people and made mercenaries, for lack of a better term, to the American people to go off and fight in these wars. You can't question any of them. They must just simply obey orders. And even barring that, paying exorbitant taxes for high-technology weaponry to do the fighting for us killing men and women who may be heretical according to the gospel, but who may be resisting this civil power, this global civil power called the papacy. 
I don't think I have a I don't think I have a responsibility. I don't have a responsibility to pay those taxes, even as much as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were fed and watered and clothed and sheltered by Nebuchadnezzar, had no obligation to bow down and worship his golden image because it violated God's law. Now, when I pay my taxes, I do it under duress. I do it under protest. And I do it with an apology on my lips to my heavenly Father for paying tribute to those who do not owe, do not deserve it, who have usurped God's rightful throne, have become a law and a God unto themselves, and have forced me to do what Shadrach and Meshach wouldn't do. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not bow to Nebuchadnezzar or his image. And I dare say, I dare say they wouldn't fight in his wars either. I mean, I mean, the taxes that we pay for streets and sewers and stop signs and police forces and things like that, I don't have a problem with. I don't think, I think this, I, I think I would be in violation of the scriptures if I didn't pay those taxes. Agree. But, but, but the government doesn't tell us what part of my taxes go to those legitimate things and what part of my taxes go to those illegitimate things. And so I have a controversy. And, and, I, and the only way for me to fight it is to educate and put pressure on the civil government and admonish the civil government at all levels, federal, state, county, local, municipal, to resist that unlawful power that has usurped the rightful throne of God Almighty and it turned the civil powers to serve him rather than God and to tax for unlawful anti-Christian endeavors to become a global police force to unite all the nations into one under one modern-day Nebuchadnezzar and to undo that which God did for our own protection. And I think, I think every one of us have a moral obligation to educate. And nowhere is that education more needed than in our churches today. It, it, my my uh, my question is, you know, is is on Romans 13 in the Third Reich. I mean, uh, they teach, they taught that also, and uh, and the question is like, you know, is it's not a question, but it's kind of piggybacking on what Key said. Uh, a perfect example of stalking, you know, in the Roman Catholic Church is used it all through history. Uh, is the Third Reich in the brown shirts? It, it's it's a it's a textbook example of what they did to a whole nation. Yeah, the Nazi regime was a persecuting regime that served the papacy and and persecuted God's people. Yes, and 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 uh, it's it's always good to for somebody just first listening to understand that that the National Socialist Party came out of Bavaria, came out of Bavaria. Why did I say Bavaria? Well, Bavaria is 98% Catholic. Uh, Bavaria never, the, the, the Protestant Reformation never uh, 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 blanketed Bavaria. If you live in Bavaria today, it's 98% Catholic. And uh, it's it's good to know that what Keith has got on his website on uncontrolled opposition and stalking to understand the techniques. It wasn't until I heard um, Michael and Keith discussing this that you fully, when you fully understand the brown shirts, it's just a textbook example. Here they come out of Bavaria and they go north. And, and, and uh, and 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 was the whole Germany? My my question is to, to not not even not to to uh, Tom, but did the whole country in German Germany did 
they, you know, they yielded to Romans 13. And the Antichrist took they over yielded, Germany. They yielded to the, the uh, teaching that is prevalent in the churches today to unquestioningly obey the civil power, the higher That's power. Right. Yeah. 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 And forget God's law. Right or wrong, you must do whatever the civil power says because it is uh, a servant of God. Now, I don't see how anybody could say that the Nazi regime was a servant of God. It was a servant of the papacy, the Antichrist. And uh, the result would have been tremendously different in Nazi Germany today had there been enough Protestantism left in Germany to expose the, the connection between the Nazi regime and the Jesuit order and Pope Pius XII. But they were taught to obey the civil power. We're up against the same brick wall today. Most Christians believe we're to obey the civil power no matter what. Are there going to be 6 million Jews killed in this country? Are there going to be 6 million Protestants killed in this country? Those who protest the Antichrist? Those who protest the papacy? That's where we're headed. That, that's exactly uh, this uh, hearing this message tonight on Romans 13 really uh, paints a very, very clear picture on what happened to Germany. The same exact thing is going on in the in the pulpits. Look! Look what happened to the Waldenses. They preached the gospel. They condemned the papacy as the Antichrist, and they would not relent. And Rome launched crusade after crusade after crusade after crusade. For hundreds and hundreds of years, the papacy pursued the Waldenses to completely wipe them off the face of the earth, and God protected them. Are we to forget the example set by the Waldenses and to capitulate to the civil power that says you must bow down to Rome? You must submit to Roman Catholic canon law through the civil power. You must work and toil and pay all your taxes so we can continue to, to, to overthrow governments that are in rebellion against the papacy, the Antichrist of the Bible. The Waldenses would rather die. And they wouldn't pay Peter's pants. They wouldn't pay the priests. They wouldn't go to Mass they steadfastly declared the papacy was the Antichrist, and they died, and their bones still remain in the Alps, bleaching in the sun to this day. Were they guilty of violating the civil power when the government of France went after them to kill them and made false peace treaties with them only to ambush them and kill them some more? That's how God's people have always been treated. Those who won't bend the knee to Baal, those who will not bend the knee to Nebuchadnezzar or worship his golden image. That's just our lot. Christ suffered the persecution of the unrighteous, and so do his followers. And uh, first, there were, you know, we, we've seen the, the Nazi regime. Everybody thinks they understand what it was all about, but the majority of Christians don't have a clue that the Nazi regime was brought to power by the Vatican for the purpose of persecuting not just the Jews, but those who held and maintained that the papacy was the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. They were truly Protestants. In the mindset, the mindset in 2004 is identical to what happened in 1933 in Germany. It's a, it's, 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 it's a textbook example, and until you understand Romans 13, I can say this, until you fully understand, and I think it was well explained tonight, Tom, it, 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 when, when, if some, if, when you don't understand Romans 13, you'll never understand the Third Reich. Yeah. 
You can't understand what really happened during the Second World War until you understand how they interpreted and preached and taught about Romans 13. It was to blindly obey the civil power because it's ordained of God. It's a servant to God. It avenges God and punishes the wicked and rewards the righteous. And that's how they viewed the Nazi party. That wasn't the Nazi party. No, it wasn't. It was that 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 was those Nationalist Socialist Party was set up by the Jesuits and and it was run run from by the papacy. Look, if 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 our if our if we understand that our government no longer serves God, but serves the Antichrist. What do we do with the passage of Scripture that says, Thou shalt not have serve two masters, or you shall love the one and despise the other? Okay? Now, as long as the civil government is a servant of God, stays within its jurisdiction, calls evil evil, and calls good good, and it rewards good and punishes evil, then we're serving only one master, Christ. But if our government begins to serve another God that has another law that runs diametrically contrary to God's holy law, God's holy immutable law, can we serve both God and man? Can we serve two masters? How can two walk together except they agree? Choice has to be made. Shall we obey man or shall we obey God? Now, not everything that the civil power does is contrary to God. So in those things that are not contrary to God, we should obey and be subject to. We shouldn't be drunkards. We we shouldn't be drunkards, no. We shouldn't be revilers. We shouldn't be brawlers. We shouldn't be thieves. We shouldn't be liars. And we should love one another as we love ourselves. And uh, we shouldn't go off to fight foreign wars to support a global regime that hates God and hates Christians and wants to bring global persecution to those who serve the God of creation and obey his laws. That government serves God. Then we have a duty to God to obey that that civil power. And if we don't obey that lawful civil power, that lawful civil power, then that civil power has the power to punish. He carries not the sword in vain. He can use the sword with God's sanction. But what about the case of a government like Nazi Germany that served not God and not his law, but another God and his law, the Pope and Roman Catholic canon law that says it is no crime, no, it is a meritorious work to kill a Protestant. It's a carbon copy. It's a carbon copy. It's a carbon copy of what's happening in 2014. Except I think it's a little bit more extreme. And the mindset it, you know, is, you know, because there isn't, today, in today's culture, there isn't a right or wrong. We live in a nation where they're advocating, the president is advocating same-sex marriage. And they and in Maryland has sanctioned it.
and you understand last week last week's message on idolatry. I mean, they they all bow down and worship a man. You know, a man in Rome, and a man with two thousand year, nearly two thousand years of history of persecuting God's people. That's who they serve. And he's coming. He's coming to America next year to speak to the Congress. Yep. yep. He came to the British government to speak. That was Pope John Paul II. And there was a man of God in the house, a Protestant, and he called him Antichrist at the top of his lungs. Antichrist! Antichrist! And they hauled him off in chains. Would to God that there was a man in this country like him. But you'll find no protestant protests against the Antichrist preaching and teaching in our government, in our halls of government. You'll hear no protests from this country. It serves two masters. It has reconciled itself to the one, and it has abandoned the other. And when you look at the correlation between sodomy and idolatry, this in this government, I can't say it was always this bad, you know, 50 years ago, but this this is sodomy. Washington D.C. is 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 the capital of sodomy. Sodom and Egypt, idolatry and sodomy, they go hand in hand. Cause and effect relationship. Wherever you find idolatry, you will find sodomy. And wherever you find sodomy, you will find idolatry. You can't be separated. God said, you shall not make unto thee any graven image. You You shall not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. And then he threatens a recompense. He says, I will visit the sin of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. And uh, many generations of idolaters live and work in Washington, D.C. and govern us all and it's not the shining city on the hill. It is the depths of depravity and uh, it dares to call itself Christian. And the pulpit's completely quiet and silent. Silent about it. And there's not a pulpit out there that's t- that's talking about what's really happening. And those who dare to speak out against it are persecuted and stalked and yes. gang stalked and denied the, the, the necessities of life, including employment. Soon they'll be denied health care. And uh, they will not have the means to sustain their own lives. But we're no different than the Bible-believing Christians that lived before us for 2,000 years. Our persecution isn't any worse than theirs. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. So, okay, Tom, I have a question. It's going to be a redundant question, most likely. Uh, well, it is. Uh, but inevitably, when somebody listens to this, it's going to run across their head, their mind uh, is that in, uh, about revolution and about are we advocating any form of revolution as far as armed revolution, something that's, that does physically... Or are we advocating something? I mean, hopefully somebody who listens to this conversation realizes what we're actually advocating, what what we're supposed to do. But um, could you make it clear one more time what, as true Bible-believing Protestant Christians are supposed to do? Are we supposed to raise up arms and try to take over the government? Or are we supposed to do what we're doing right now, exposing its weakness? Wicked, wickedness. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm going to expose its wickedness and uh, hope that there's enough 
Protestantism left in this country to gain enough momentum to put this uh, monster back, this beast back in its box, but I don't think it's going to happen. And I'm certainly not launching any physical uh, overthrow of the government. I'm not going to resort to violence. Uh, those who live by the sword should die by the sword. Those who are gathering up guns and ammunition and food and supplies and ready to overthrow the government, they're, they're going to be subject to uh, the sword. They're going to die fighting. And look, eventually the Waldensians, having been pursued for hundreds of years, had to resort to the sword to prevent from being completely annihilated. And if it hadn't been for... Uh, Cromwell, or uh, rather, uh, yes, Cromwell, they never would have been liberated from Rome's persecutions. They would have been completely annihilated, and their history would have been removed. And uh, you know, I don't think the answer is the sword, but uh, uh, certainly there are multitudes of Christians who are preparing for an armed confrontation with this beast. And uh, I have a right to protect myself and protect my family, and I'd be less than an infidel if I didn't. But I don't live by the sword. I live by the word of God. And uh, I'll admonish this Antichrist government so God takes my last breath and uh, advise others to do the same. But if you can't control the beast with reason then you can expect the beast to behave as most beasts do. And this fourth and final beast upon the earth is unlike any before it. And it tramples the righteous with the fury of iron. And it has for 2,000 years. I intend to go to my end if it's a forceful end. I intend to go down condemning this Antichrist government and the papacy as its mother and spouse. And uh, I hope God forgives my sins. For so many years I believed in futurism. I had no idea that the papacy has always been the Antichrist of the Scripture. And now I find myself an abject slave to the papacy, because I'm a slave to the civil government, which he controls. And, uh, you know, we, we what we did as Christians, we failed to remain separate from the world. We failed in our mission, just like the Israelites did. They were supposed to be the shining city on a hill, to be separate and unlike the pagan nations, to obey God's law, to exercise his justice, to, he gave them their economic law, their dietary law, every kind of law. They were a model society when they were obedient. And uh, they failed, and we failed too. The body of Christ has failed, at least the body of Christ in this country, because you don't, see, you don't hear any outcry against the Antichrist nor do, they, do you hear of any condemnation of, the, of the, the amount of authority and control that he exercises over every aspect of our government, our economic system, our education system, our banking, our schools, our pulpits, our courts, our commerce, everything. No condemnation of the papacy. No exposure of the papacy's control and regulation and lordship over all of these things, every aspect of our lives. And, uh, I, I think we have failed even more miserably than Israel did. And look what happened to Israel. What could we expect? Is God a respecter of persons? Is God to treat us differently than he treated the Jews for the same, for the same crimes? 
They wanted to worship like the heathen, so God made them slaves to heathen nations and kings. And that's what we find ourselves, once you fully understand what's going on in this country. We're an abject slave of our civil government, and by default, we are abject slaves of the papacy, whether we claim Roman Catholicism or whether we claim Protestantism, we still serve the papacy in every aspect of our lives, including marriage. I don't want to seem like I'm rambling, but look, what man of God ever had to get a license to marry? We get licenses to marry now because the papacy calls marriage a sacrament. They own it. The institution of marriage, according to the papacy, belongs solely to the papacy. And anyone who's not a baptized Roman Catholic who wishes to marry must get a license. And that's issued by the civil government that serves the papacy. See, it doesn't serve God, or it wouldn't be issuing a license to do what is lawful. Licenses are only issued to those who wish to do what is unlawful according to God's law. Marriage is not unlawful, and it does not require a license. So what a license constitutes is a, an indulgence from the papacy, an exception. But in order to get that, that exception, you have to accept the, the civil power's authority over the marriage and the produce of the marriage, like children. And many households where the parents have been determined to be heretics, then the civil government takes the children from the house because the papacy, is, the papacy claims those children through the marriage license, the indulgence that was issued by the state. And I don't need to tell you that people born in this country now, when, when God told the king of Israel never to number the people, that was for God to know and for him only. And he forbid the king to go about numbering the people. Well, in this country called Christian, we're issued numbers at birth. And he numbers us, a false king. And our government numbers us at the behest of the papacy. I could go on and on and on all night long with example after example after example how from cradle to grave we are abject slaves to the civil power which is by default an abject slave to the papacy who controls it and by whose authority it reigns over the people. 